As we face unprecedented challenges due to the impact of climate change, global poverty, pandemics, bigger, bolder approaches are mandated. These challenges can only be addressed by a strong engagement, partnership, and cooperation between the academic universities, research agencies, and industry leaders. For the first time in Accra, we are including a significant focus on research and science coming from the industry. In the first session today, we, have, we are fortunate to have speakers from NASA, DARPA, and Bosch, who are going to talk to us about some of the biggest challenges they have been working towards, ranging all the way from space exploration, accelerating technology through challenges, and bringing autonomous driving from research to deployment. We are very grateful to have them take their time off their busy schedule and join us from far away locations and distant time zones. Our first speaker is Dr. Terry Fong. Uh, Terry is a NASA senior research, uh, NASA senior scientist for autonomous systems and chief roboticist at NASA Ames Research Center. Terry is also the deputy manager for NASA's Viper rover, uh, which he'll be talking about today, which will prospect for water ice on moon in 2023. Terry previously led development of the Astro B free flying robot, which was deployed in the International Space Station in 2019. Terry has published more than 150 papers in space and field robotics, human-robot interaction, virtual reality, user interfaces, and planetary mapping. With that, let me hand over the mantle to Terry, who is joining us from the States. So good morning. Um, thanks for that great introduction. Um, I'm very glad to join you uh, remotely, although I would have been even more excited to be there in person, uh, like the rest of you, I'm sure. I'm going to talk uh, for the next 20, 25 minutes or so about uh, um, NASA's uh, lunar rover mission called Viper. Um, this is something that uh, is a very exciting mission for us. It'll actually be NASA's first uh, robotic surface mission to the moon. It's something we hope to launch uh, in just about three years from now. So it's under very active development. Uh, Viper stands for the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. Um, it's, it's a rover that we're building to, to send to high latitude regions of the moon and look for subsurface water ice. Um, but to uh, kind of motivate this here, uh, Viper is, is something that we've been really interested in for a while. In fact, ever since 1994, when the Clementine mission uh, returned some interesting data that seemed to imply the presence of, of water ice possibly on the moon. Um, and then subsequent to Clementine, a number of other missions, including Lunar Prospector, uh, the LCROSS uh, LRO mission, uh, Chandrayaan-1, all seem to indicate that uh, there are uh, perhaps significant deposits of water ice uh, buried in the subsurface uh, in the polar regions. Um, and of course, you know, this raises a lot of interest uh, because if it is in fact uh, the case that there is water ice and then we can actually exploit it in a reasonable manner, that really changes the entire game of how we might actually explore not just the moon, but beyond the moon. Because of course, uh, the presence of water ice means that we can actually get hydrogen and oxygen um, as native resources from the moon. Uh, basically, we would mine the moon for these resources and use that to support humans, uh, as well as to uh, uh, be a source for fuel for uh, various uh, things that we would care about, you know, uh, operations on the moon, as well as uh, perhaps rockets that uh, could be launched from the moon or, or for perhaps uh, be refueled from uh, sources that come from the moon. And so it's a very exciting, interesting thing. But the problem, of course, is we don't know exactly, you know, how much water ice there is, uh, what quantities are there, uh, what is the overall form, um, you know, what is the uh, the difficulty of actually accessing this material. And so out of all that interest was born the interest of creating a robotic mission to go prospect for water ice uh, on the kind of scales that we would care about and uh, use the information from that to build a resource maps of the polar regions. The, uh, the overall you know, way this fits into this here, of course, is that you know, we have had these prior missions which have made orbital observations of the moon. Um, we've done a little bit of impact ground truthing. Uh, the LCROSS mission impacted Cabea's crater a few years ago and provided additional data. Um, and what we're really looking for is a mission to help bridge sort of all the basic you know, research, prospecting, data collection, and to help inform future exploitation of these resources, you know, being able to go actually extract, mine, process, and then turn that into things that we care about. So Viper really, for NASA, is a bridge mission. Uh, it's the kind of mission that helps bridge all the information gathering that we, we need to do both in orbit and uh, on the surface, and, and helps set up a future where we can actually look at the use of lunar resources. We know from decades of study that the moon has water, but where and how much? In 2023, a robotic rover will explore the moon's surface in search of water ice. 
NASA's Viper Moon Rover will perform the first resource mapping mission on another world, using advanced instruments and tools to determine the location and concentration of water on the moon. To send Viper to the moon, we're leveraging industry as part of our commercial lunar payload services program, a program designed to send science instruments and technology payloads to the surface of the moon. Viper represents a very different development paradigm. We are developing each instrument for launch on Eclipse ahead of Viper, totally flipping on its head how we normally do this. This is truly creative. An industry partner will launch Viper to the moon's south pole. This is a place where no human or rover has ever been before. The rover's survey will provide scientists with the most detailed view of the moon's water to date and point to spots where water could be harvested by future astronauts. Viper will be the first resource mapping mission on the surface of another celestial body. It represents a new kind of mission for NASA in which the objectives of advancing science and human exploration are closer than ever. The measurements that Viper's instruments will make can help us understand the source and distribution of the water and other volatiles on the moon, giving us insight into the evolution of the moon and the Earth-Moon system. The moon's water is also a precious resource that could be extracted to support human exploration of the moon and beyond. What we learn from Viper will bring us a step closer to developing a sustainable, long-term human presence on the moon. So I hope the audio came through with everybody. Um, you know, Viper is a mission that, uh, as I said, is under development right now, and uh, we are targeting a 2023 launch. Um, it's an interesting mission because it is, um, in many respects, quite different from prior planetary missions that NASA has developed. One thing, it's meant to be a relatively short-term uh, planetary surface mission, um, a 100-day mission, um, and that's really governed by the fact that we have to deal with a very challenging environment on the moon. Uh, we are sending a solar-powered rover uh, into a place uh, where we have incredible swings of temperature, in, in particular when we get into lunar night or some of these permanently shadow regions uh, where we actually believe is the, the primary location for these subsurface uh, uh, water ice deposits, um, gets extremely cold. Um, and of course, you can imagine if you only have solar power and batteries that are used to then power heaters, uh, it really you know, constrains the amount of time that you can survive before basically you freeze to death. Um, the mission overall is designed to, to characterize the distribution and the physical state of these, these volatiles, uh, the water ice deposits, um, and to help, as I said before, to develop these resource maps. Um, there are a number of interesting challenges about the environment. Uh, it's, it's certainly a much more dynamic environment than we've ever sent a, a robot before, at least in terms of a planetary rover. You know, one thing is that because we're at a high latitude on the moon, you know, near the South Pole, which is our target uh, destination at the moment, uh, it's a place where we have uh, low angle illumination. The sun is very low to the horizon, perhaps only a few degrees on the order of maybe uh, seven to, to 10 degrees above the horizon. We have long cast shadows. Um, and because of this, we have actually fairly rapidly moving shadows. Um, and there are some locations where the shadows move as fast as a centimeter per second, uh, which in terms of planetary rovers uh, is an incredibly dynamic environment. We also depend upon real time communications to earth for operations, that's direct line of sight. And so um, an interesting challenge, too, is the fact that near the polar regions, the geometry of the Earth and Moon, make it appear that the Earth is rising and setting um, over, um, you know, a, a couple week period. And so you know, one of the interesting things is, is how do you actually do the planning for this dynamic environment? How do you make the rover move from point to point in such a way that it maintains an average speed made good, so an average uh, rate of progress across the surface so that you can stay in sunlight and avoid the shadows? Um, and then you can actually be in the right location when you where you when you need to be at the right at particular places. Um, Viper is designed to explore a number of different kinds of areas on the moon. We um, have hypothesized that there are a number of different uh, ice stability regions. There are places where uh, ice can be stable uh, even at the surface. Uh, and so part of our goal here is to try to to confirm these hypotheses to really test uh, you know the fact that uh, we believe that ice you know, certainly can exist in permanently shadowed areas below the subsurface, but perhaps it's also stable in areas that are closer to the subsurface, uh, to, to the surface, perhaps even within the first 50 centimeters. And uh, there are certainly places, uh, especially these permanently shadowed areas, areas which never see sunlight, where we do believe to see some uh, ice stable even at the surface itself. Uh, 
an interesting thing about Viper also is that it's not being carried on a government uh, uh, launch system. It will actually be flying on an astrobotic uh, Griffin lander. This is their larger lander. Uh, it will not be the first astrobotic flight, but uh, it will be the first flight of their Griffin lander. Um, that's all part of the uh, Commercial Lunar Payload Services program that NASA started uh, a little while ago. And here we're interesting. The idea is basically we're buying a ride. Um, so Viper will be uh, integrated uh, onto Astrobotics Lander, and then Astrobotic is responsible just like, you know, the post office or FedEx or UPS to, to transport us uh, to the moon. Uh, and then uh, they will deploy ramps. Um, the lander is designed to have ramps on the front and the back. Uh, we will roll off, and then once we're off, uh, we, are, we are done with Astrobotic, and the primary mission for, for Viper commences. So the current design of Viper is a, is a four-wheel rover uh, powered by solar arrays on three sides. It carries a number of different instruments that are used for prospecting, uh, looking for uh, subsurface water ice. Uh, we carry a neutron spectrometer, a near-IR spectrometer. Uh, there's a mass spectrometer as well. Those are coupled together with the overall notion of we first are prospecting, looking for locations where we believe that there are high concentrations of, of, uh, of ice deposits. And then we use a drill um, to drill down to the near subsurface between uh, half a meter to one meter, extract the tailings, and then we uh, analyze those with a mass spectrometer. Um, from a robotic standpoint, um, the interesting thing, of course, uh, are not the instruments, but you know how the robot operates itself. It does carry a number of different sensors for positioning. Uh, uh, there's an inertial measurement unit, a star tracker. We have stereo cameras. Um, and we are, of course, making use of data we already have about the moon, uh, in particular 3D maps that are built from images taken from orbit, uh, primarily from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The rover itself uh, is, is targeted at this point to be a 475 kilogram system. That's the complete integrated rover with its instruments, as well as the lander release mechanism. It's about 1.7 by 1.7 uh, meters in footprint, uh, half meter wheels. Uh, it's designed to operate on uh, 15 degree slopes to go up to 20 kilometers range. And our max traverse speed is about 20 centimeters per second, which of course compared to terrestrial vehicles is not very fast but it's significantly faster than the, the rovers we have sent to Mars uh, to date. Uh, and communication, as I mentioned already, is direct uh, to Earth um, communications. It's actually relatively uh, low bandwidth, uh, and that is really limited by what we can get from the, the, deep, the deep space network for this kind of mission here. It is also relatively short time delay, um, six to 10 seconds. Uh, that includes buffering on the ground stations. It's, it's not just the, you know, the time it takes for the signal to travel from uh, the, the Earth to the moon and back, but also the fact that there is buffering when we actually make use of the deep space network. In comparison, um, just to show you um, how Viper stacks up against uh, other systems here, this is relatively to scale. I wouldn't say it's 100% accurate here, um, but it's, it's more or less a similar scale to the Mars exploration rovers, you know, Spirit and Opportunity um, that were, were launched back in, in, in 2004. It's certainly smaller than uh, the Mars Science Laboratory, Curiosity, and, and uh, of course, uh, Mars 2020, the Perseverance rover, which will land in just a couple of months. Um, but again, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a different kind of environment. It's targeted for the moon, not Mars. Uh, it is going to a polar region, um, and the science on board, of course, is quite different than the past rovers we've, we've developed here at NASA. Um, and that takes me to this one, which is a kind of summary of some of the, the, the new things that we're interested in doing with Viper. First off, it is going to this dynamic environment, uh, the polar region of the moon. And part of that is then reflected by the fact that we are designing for a, a high operational cadence for NASA, uh, really very interactive with, with a rover in a way that we've never had before. The, the Mars rovers, of course, we have 20 to 40 minutes round trip delay. Uh, we typically only interact with them uh, maybe once per day or at least one, once per Martian day or so. Uh, Viper is gonna be continuously interactive with the ground. We'll be operating it with command cycles in the order of minutes and uh, basically sending it short drive commands 24-7 um, when we have communications and sunlight. Um, it's also being developed as a much uh, cheaper and much faster mission. Um, the development only started a year ago and we're already planning to, to launch in three years, which is uh, probably about half the time that, that uh, NASA has spent on, on prior missions. Um, interesting thing about the mission operations is that there is real-time mission control. We actually have a driver team uh, responsible for driving the robot that interacts with a real-time science team that's looking at data coming off the mission in real time. The overall uh, approach here for driving is uh, we're sending single waypoint commands approximately uh, four to five meters ahead of the current position and the rover autonomously drives that short uh, waypoint distance. 
And so in terms of mission operations, we think of this as a hybrid of uh, the kinds of operations we conduct on the space station today, which is very interactive with the ground, and Mars rover missions, uh, which make use of things like uh, you know, waypoint driving and supervisory control, but of course has much higher time uh, latency associated with it. Um, for those of you interested in kind of the, the guts of the rover, just to give you a very, very uh, brief um, overview, um, in terms of computing, we're using a combination of radiation hardened and radiation tolerant computing. Uh, the RAD 750, which is of course the workhorse of space missions is a very slow processor. Uh, I think the one that we're using is 133 megahertz. Um, so very slow, but you know, very solid, robust processor. And we're combining that with a, uh, a red tolerant faster processor used primarily for image processing. Uh, an interesting thing is that the flight software is split um, between onboard and ground functions. Um, because we are relatively short time delay, we've chosen to basically offboard some of our processing to the ground. And so for example, we will downlink images and perform uh, the stereo processing and localization estimation will be done on the ground, um, but still quote unquote, you know, part of the Rover software. Um, interestingly also, we're making uh, use of ROS2 as part of the ground software. That's both for data distribution as well as for some of the processing. We also are making extensive use of, um, of ROS and Gazebo for simulation that supports our development right now. Uh, will then feed into to testing and training and ultimately be part of mission operations as well. Um, here's just a video showing some testing. This was actually um, over a year ago now. This is one of the, uh, the earlier prototypes of, uh, of Viper. Um, we actually have been building a number of different prototypes. This one was really focused uh, not on trying to replicate the entire rover, but really just to focus on the, uh, the locomotion system here. So you can see the half meter wheels. Um, they are independently steered, independently driven and adjustable. So we can uh, turn in place, we can uh, adjust the overall baseline and the angle uh, of the different wheels so we can drive and we can even do this kind of swimming motion. Uh, this is testing at NASA Glenn in Cleveland where we have a, a large terra mechanics uh, test bed. And uh, in this place we've done all kinds of basically uh, you know, uh, torture tests for, for robots, uh, looking at different kinds of of spin, um, traversing different kinds of slopes and obstacles. And they're just representing the kind of work that we're doing to develop Viper. Um, the other interesting thing of course, is that we're going to a very challenging uh, illumination environment. And so one of the things that we are looking at is, is how to really deal with the fact that we have low angle sun illumination. We have um, you know, long cast shadows. Um, and of course that makes it very difficult because of the dynamic range be between the sunlight um, and the shadows here. So at NASA, one of the test beds we have is, an, is a, a facility that we call the Lunar Lab. It's actually a fairly large uh, sandbox with uh, eight tons of JSC-1A regolith simulant, uh, lunar simulant here. And uh, we do things like, like test the illumination. We've developed uh, a number of different systems for assessing stereo performance in particular, um, looking at different cases of illumin uh, illumination angle and uh, Interesting properties about the, the lunar soils, um, it tends to reflect light in a way um, that's quite different than what we see here on Earth. Um, I mentioned before that we are doing a lot of development uh, with Gazebo. Um, one of the challenges of, of working uh, for lunar missions is that uh, there's no place on Earth that really accurately uh, simulates all the different aspects you might care about. Uh, and so we are relying on uh, computer simulation a lot, in particular for illumination modeling, uh, you know, real-time shadows, uh, looking at uh, the interaction between uh, driving modes of operation and uh, and how we could actually operate over in a high fidelity simulated environment here. Um, and so we use Gazebo. Um, this is work that we've done with uh, with OSRF uh, to really sort of extend and improve Gazebo in a number of different ways uh, that would support missions like um, Viper. Uh, give you an idea here. This is a a, a a video uh, from our simulator. This is this is gazebo under the hood. Really, it may not look like it, with the synthetic terrain that we've uh, generated. So the synthetic terrain here is higher resolution data than we actually have from uh, from actual uh, satellite images. We've taken data from the lunar reconnaissance orbiter and uh, uh, done a bit of work to synthetically enhance that to increase uh, the resolution and to add rover scale obstacles in terms of craters and rocks. But uh, we then take that, plug it into Gazebo. We've added custom shaders. Um, so actually, if you look at the top, you can see the shadow there in the center. It's, it's a bit brighter, the albedo there. That, uh, that is something called the opposition surge or opposition effect that you get on the moon when you're looking basically directly down sun. 
Um, and this is just kind of showing uh, sort of real-time simulation, including shadowing that we're using right now for doing our development. Um, but with that, I think I'll just wrap up here because um, I want to make sure we have some time to, to chat if there are questions here and just point out that uh, we do hope to have this robot uh, on its way to the moon, if not land on the moon about three years from now. Um, so it might be a good Christmas present in, in about three years. Um, and with that, if there are questions about Viper, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Ray. That was an excellent talk. Um, we are uh, getting a few questions coming in from the Slack channel. Um, to just kick off the, the discussion, I'll have the first question going through. Um, in your opinion, when you actually build up these kind of uh, missions and design a system that goes to the moon and does a lot of things, um, where do you see the challenges lie? Are these more scientific challenges that haven't been solved yet? These are new um, topics that haven't been explored? Or are these technological advancements that are still needed to be done, like the systems are not robust enough and we know how to do it, it's just that we haven't been able to put a systems level development a team behind it? I think, I think it's a bit of both of those things. I mean, certainly there's a lot of scientific questions about the moon um, or frankly other places in, in the solar system that are still unanswered. But um, a lot of the challenge uh, these days has to do with the technology needed to carry out certain missions. Um, you know, we have been taking the approach with Viper that uh, we are trying to do this rapidly, which of course means that you can't uh, take risks everywhere. You have to be kind of managing the, the risks in terms of technology. Uh, so for example, you know, I would not consider Viper by any stretch of the imagination to be a particularly autonomous mission. Um, however, it is trying to break ground in a number of areas. Uh, for example, the use of, of ROS as part of um, our flight software development. I mean, that's pretty much unheard of. Every single prior mission has been custom software. And that's because we have to go through very extensive testing, um, you know, verification, validation that it meets requirements. And because of that, the use of third party software, especially, you know, software that has no formal traceability is something that NASA has shied away from. Um, in addition, uh, the fact is that, that computing in space is still, uh, you know, horribly slow. Um, every year it gets more and more behind. It's not just one year behind. I mean, you know, the progress uh, terrestrially is, is, you know, thousands of times faster than what we have for space. And so trying to find ways, uh, like I said, we've, we've taken the, the choice to, to split the software to make it kind of hybrid. We're using a combination of RAD hard and RAD tolerant computing, just trying to get a little bit more horsepower out there because we know you know, on earth, there's so much we can do. And trying to make that work in space is, is I think the, the real challenge for, for engineers. Thanks, Jay. We have a few excellent questions coming in from Slack. Uh, one of the first questions was regarding the, uh, I'll combine a few questions into one topic. So one of the, the, the key questions were regarding the simulator, the availability of the simulator and the implementation of data mechanics um, models that are being used for that. So could you comment on, on the, uh, the system fidelity of these simulators and how they match up with the, uh, with the real world? Yeah, so we started working on the simulator um, uh, actually a few years ago. Um, there was a prior mission in development before Viper called Resource Prospector. Um, and back in 2018, um, we did a, a fair amount of development that really focused on trying to, to get the appearance modeling uh, fairly high fidelity. Um, actually, there was, a, there was a paper at an IEEE conference back in 2018 that describes that. So I would say the simulator we have today is, is, uh, is actually quite good in terms of the way that it represents illumination, um, uh, reflectance modeling, um, and our ability to use synthetic uh, terrains for that. Um, we have not um, yet gotten to the point where we feel like the terra mechanics modeling is uh, sufficiently good to trust that. Um, which is why we are doing a lot of extensive testing, as I showed in one of those videos at, at NASA Glenn, um, you know, at least under laboratory conditions. Now, the reality is that all of that is, is still challenging to us um, for the moon. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I, I, every time I, I, I talk with people, um, you know, my colleagues down at JPL, I'm, I'm really envious because, uh, you know, they've designed missions for, for Mars. And of course, the gravity on Mars is much closer to the Earth. Um, the moon, of course, is not. And so we have to figure out ways to, to scale down uh, to like one sixth, um, you know, the mass in order to have similar performance in Earth. And it's a huge challenge. Um, the rover that you saw in the testing um, at NASA Glenn is designed to be, you know, a mass equivalent uh, to what we're going to take to the moon, which means it's got to be one sixth the mass. But, you know, there's only so much in terms of like actuators and structure that you can reduce. 
and we certainly can't reduce the, the mass of the soil. Um, individual grains is no way to do that. And so there are lots of challenges, I think, from a mechanics um, and a term mechanics point of view in particular that are really hard to simulate. Thanks, Jay. I'll take one last question, but please keep sending uh, questions on Slack and we'll respond there. Uh, one last question was, um, this is from Ash, and um, his question was about augmenting the perception of the rover. So his question literally was, will you be able to have eyes on the rover from optical terrestrial telescopes? That's a great question. I don't know if you'll actually be able to resolve it. Um, it's a really small rover relative to the moon, of course, you know, 1.7 meters. Um, we should be able to see that from orbit if uh, the lunar reconnaissance orbiter is still functioning and happens to be in favorable position to do that. Um, but observation from Earth, I don't know. It's it's uh, that's that would be an exciting thing, but uh, I don't know if that's going to be possible. <laughs> All right, thanks, Terry. Um, so, I'll, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the to the next speaker. So, the next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Timothy Chung. So, Dr. Timothy uh, Chung has um, <clears throat> has joined DARPA's technical tactical technology office as a program manager in February 2016. He serves as a program manager for Offensive Swarm Enabled Tactics Program and the DARPA Subterranean Challenge. His interests include autonomous unmanned aerial vehicles, collaborative autonomy for unmanned swarm system capabilities, distributed perception, distributed decision making, and counter unmanned system technologies. Prior to, uh, prior to joining DARPA, Dr. Chung served as the Assistant Professor of Naval Postgraduate School and Director of Advanced Robotic Systems Engineering Laboratory, Arsenal. His academic interests include modeling, analysis, and systems engineering or operating systems involving unmanned systems, um, combining collaborative autonomy development efforts with an extensive life fly field experimentation program for swarm and counter swarm unmanned systems, tactical and associated technologies. Dr. Chung also served as a Deputy Director for the Secretary of Navy Initiative for Consortium for Robotics and Unmanned Systems Education and Research, CRUSER. With that, let me uh, invite Dr. Tim for, uh, for this talk. He's joining us from the States. Hi, thank you very much, everyone. Good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, yes, we are good. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's a pleasure to join you today. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen here. And definitely pleased to have this opportunity to join you. I, I'm, I'm really excited to, to, uh, to, to share a little bit about DARPA as well as the DARPA Subterranean Challenge today. Specifically interested in how we can make use of these types of challenge constructs to help advance some of the technologies uh, that we're interested in. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm Tim Chung uh, and I'm at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency and um, you know, share a little bit about more what, what that means. Okay. So at the heart of the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, we're really interested in understanding uh, a, a complex environment, specifically the complex subterranean environment. And really what the problem we're trying to solve is being able to provide first responders, let's say to an emergency scenario or our warfighters going into underground combat environments that notion of a rapid and actionable situational awareness. And that's one of the main difficulties we have because we often send these first responders in uh, to respond to that scenario and they might just not have a good understanding of where the hazards are, what the needs are, where the survivors are located, et cetera. And so um, that's what we tend to call actionable. How can we provide information that will deliver to the incident commander, for example, uh, how best to make use of the resources he or she might have. Now, one of the challenges, of course, is um, the underground. When you say the underground, well, there's just so much to, to the diversity of the underground environment, whether you're talking about human-made tunnel environments like mine, uh, like mines, which I know is a major industry there in Australia, uh, the urban underground, whether that's transit or infrastructure, as well as naturally occurring cave networks, not unlike maybe some of the cave-like structures you might find uh, you know, on the moon or, or elsewhere. And so how do you wrestle with development of technology that needs to transcend the differences across these subdomains while capitalizing on some of their similarities? 
And so at the end of the day, the DARPA Subterranean Challenge is really interested in inspiring those robotic technologies that will deliver actionable situational awareness and be able to do this across multiple and diverse underground environments. So the way we structured this DARPA Subterranean Challenge is uh, much like you might train for a triathlon. What we're interested in here is not the best runner or the best swimmer set of robots. We're interested in the set of robots that can do all of those uh, events, if you will, um, and be the best all around set of athletes. And so the way we've structured the DARPA sub T challenge, as we call it, is first facing these teams of robots is the tunnel circuits. We conducted that back in August uh, of last year in an inner research coal mine, just to give you some context. Six months thereafter, we're in an unfinished nuclear power plant studying the challenges of the underground urban setting and nominally looking at the cave environment uh, this fall. And so just to highlight what that looks like uh, from the urban circuit, just uh, to, to showcase, let me share the here. This is a very exciting experience. So many good teams from all around the world. This is a way to be challenged and to learn things. Can we use our existing technology, our existing expertise? A lot of the world is going to end up having these fleets of robots. It's very exciting to see all these various and different technologies that are state of the art. The Subway Challenge for us represents everything that relates to how we can make robots to be resilient in extreme conditions. This is kind of a step up for us, you know, even bigger of a challenge than we faced so far. It sells to all robotics. Make sure that your robots are able to do their mission. This is absolutely difficult at the moment. So hopefully that shared, I uh, hope many of you caught the glimpse of uh, perhaps the hometown favorites of CSIRO uh, Data61 competing as one of our systems competitors. Um, and, but, you know, really is an international competition uh, highlighting, bringing, you know, you never know where those new technologies will be found. Um, so of course, as we all know, and why we're all here on Zoom this evening or, or morning is uh, the challenges of trying to muster these teams from all around the world and uh, do so well. All along, the sub T challenge has had two thrusts. One has been on the sub on the systems competition, where you build physical teams of robots to compete in these challenging underground settings. But also, in parallel, has been the virtual competition. So fortunately, we were able to conduct the cir cave circuit competition in a virtual setting. Welcome to DARPA Subterranean Challenge, the Cave Circuit. 16 teams from all over the world, well, they're testing their autonomous systems virtually. Clearly this is the world's top research groups coming together to solve this unique challenge. There are a lot of lessons learned that you can learn from simulation where it might be too costly or dangerous or time consuming to go out and test in the real world. We think that the virtual is a chance to showcase ourselves. And there in the virtual competition, you also had another hometown favorite is uh, A Uno 
which is based out there in Brisbane. So really just wanted to highlight uh, that as an intro, but the problem we're trying to solve at a technical level is providing that actionable situational awareness. And the challenge model is designed to uh, identify a, 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 an optimization function, if you will, that will inspire the development of those technologies. And so the way we've done it here for the sub-T challenge is placing objects, we call them artifacts, and putting them all throughout these underground environments, whether that's in the physical world or in a simulated one. And in a fixed amount of time, let's say in an hour, you have to go and do that underground scavenger hunt. Go as find as many of those artifacts, as many as you can within the time allowed, and be able to position them in a global context, in an absolute reference frame, to within five meters uh, air of their true global position. So what that really offers here is a challenge to try to focus on both the, not just providing map information, which of course these robots will necessarily need to do, but actually being able to position, find, detect, and localize objects that are relevant to a particular scenario and report that back to some sort of a base station to, to get scored out. So um, the construct here is uh, what we, you know, the concept of operations is uh, these robots, you know, in the, in the scheme of things, we're interested in sending these robots in before the first responders need to go in. Let's keep them out of harm's way as long as possible and provide as much information to the incident commander uh, as much as possible. So the way we've parallel kind of mirrored the systems and the virtual competition is that the courses are unseen prior to the events to any of the human competitors and actually to the robots themselves as well. We set up the pit crew in the staging area. There's a base station that can receive uh, and, and transmit as appropriate a human supervisor, a single human supervisor's permitted to sit in that staging area. And then the clock starts and the robots are deployed and they have to go find these artifacts. And of course, any reports of those artifacts, assuming that there's comp communications range, um, gets reported back to the staging area by that human supervisor reports over to DARPA and then we get to score that. So this is really where a little bit of the human machine teaming uh, comes into play because there is still a role for the human supervisor to play here. Kind of uh, flipping that over to the virtual competition in our cloud-based infrastructure, uh, we're able to generate a number of virtual uh, environments. Those are hidden to the competitors. They get plenty of practice worlds that they can go work on, but the competition worlds are hidden from them until game day. They submit their Docker images uh, corresponding to their robot controllers, uh, their autonomy and perception packages that gets uploaded and we get to run them against those unseen, unknown virtual worlds and score them accordingly there as well. So that's a situation where it's more interested in understanding the role of complete autonomy where there is no human uh, fault management, recovery, artifact detection, or anything along the lines. But that's really uh, a, a parallel between the two. And so what we see, of course, are myriad solutions coming uh, to, and being brought to bear. So this is just a, a snapshot, uh, a gallery of the sets of robots that we're seeing being brought to the Sub-T Challenge in the physical competition, in the systems competition. Of course, we see uh, you know, entries from the wheeled and tracked, uh, but legged robots are, are definitely showing up in force and aerial robots as well. Uh, everything from collision tolerant to uh, blimps uh, to, to navigate these underground spaces. So that diversity is part of what a challenge is all about. Uh, not necessarily saying that there is one right answer. In fact, saying that we think there's an answer, but we don't quite know what it is yet. And this is an opportunity for those technologies to, to, to bubble up and, and be demonstrated uh, in, in a realistic uh, construct. Similarly, in the virtual competition side, we go through the same thing. These are in fact robots that you just saw on the previous page turned into virtualized models and their controllers and, and uh, system parameters are validated against empirical data. And we can insert them alongside other virtual models into what we call the sub tech repo. But this is just to showcase this bridging between the systems and the virtual that allows for us to study how robots that worked in the physical domain how, they, how that translates to studying and accelerating the technologies in the virtual domain, like we heard from Terry in the prior talk, as well as going vice versa. What are the things that we can accelerate in the 
synthetic environments and translate almost immediately, capitalizing on, on things like ignition gazebo simulation and, and ROS-based tools. That sub T tech repo that I mentioned, it's kind of your one-stop shop for where you can go and look for not just robot models like I showed you on the previous page, but also other simulation assets. That includes things like building block tiles. So we have well over 70 tiles in there corresponding to just the cave environments themselves. So hundreds of tiles that you can mix and match to build and design or procedurally generate your own simulation test worlds as well. And this is a place where you can now start to imagine ex exploring the design trade space to your heart's content. Here's just an example, just to highlight what we just completed in the cave circuit. Here are eight competition worlds, again, unknown to the competitors a priori. Uh, and what I wanted to highlight here as well is that the rock in a hard place cave, uh, sorry, um, synthetic world, the virtual world there, is actually modeled off of a data set that, that uh, was collected just a couple of miles, or sorry, a couple of hours outside of Sydney at Genelin Caves. So for any of you who are cavers or interested cavers, uh, you know, we were able to take advantage of that 3D point cloud, turn it into a mesh, put it into the Sub-T simulator based on Ignition Gazebo as well, and use that directly in the virtual competition, seeing how the robotic autonomy and perception algorithms can handle uh, a realistic, a much more realistic world. Okay. And at the end of the day, you know, that competition, we have those eight worlds, we aggregate how many artifacts, how many points they score for each of the artifacts that they get, and uh, rack and stack them, and you see uh, out of our 16 teams representing, uh, you know, countries from all around the world, uh, in including Australia, um, you know, how that, how that shakes out. And um, part of what the GARPA sub T challenge uses is, of course, monetary prizes. So incentives, incentivizes development in a variety of different ways. So at the end of the day, if you're a competitor, you're looking for a piece potentially for a piece of that $6 million prize purse um, as, as you're going through each one of these events uh, going along. So as I mentioned, we're at the CAVE circuit we've just completed. The teams are uh, doing their lessons learned, or how I like to say, going and licking their wounds after having fallen off or rolled over their robots and are marching towards the final stage of competition. So taking one step back, the context of this presentation was, how do we make use of these types of challenges uh, that DARPA really has uh, embraced over the many years, uh, including, for example, the DARPA Grand Challenge, looking at self-driving car technologies, and how do we use those to accelerate technologies? And so I wanted to share a little bit uh, of that background. Prize challenges have a long history of spurring great technical innovation. These competitions, designed to foster progress toward or achievement of a specific objective by offering a named prize or award, have been led by government and private groups. However, it wasn't until the early 21st century that the United States government first held a prize challenge. It was in our budget that DARPA had the authority to do prize awards, and the question is, how do we use it? We had a military problem, which really required vehicles that could be driven without people in them. We had a situation in the desert where a logistical convoy got ambushed. So we said, how can we stop that? How do I save lives? So that's the reason we went with the, uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge. And I remember reading about that challenge and being awe-inspired, thinking as a grad student, what could I do to compete? Challenges by their nature are high risk. The major risk in doing something new is that it uh, fails. The question in my mind is how far would they go? A car went a little over seven miles and it was supposed to go 150 miles. And I said, you know, I want you to look at this like Kitty Hawk. And Kitty Hawk, if you were there, it wasn't very impressive. They catapulted this thing into the air. It went for 30 seconds. And that 30 seconds, however, proved that it could be done. And that's what we did today. It's not that you fail but what did you learn and how can you improve that for the next time? 
The 2005 Grand Challenge and 2007 Urban Challenge saw competitors advance the technology and emerge victorious. And the U.S. government saw that prize challenges were a viable method for spurring innovation. DARPA has continued to utilize prize challenges of all sizes across a diverse set of technical areas to develop new and innovative solutions to intractable problems from unexpected sources. I think some of the ideas of how to use a challenge have continued to evolve. Many of the challenges have similar flavors with one another, and they certainly share some of that genetic code from the very first DARPA challenge. But each one addresses different problems, and they do it in very different ways. I think all of those evolutions are natural and allow for us to truly adapt the concept of a challenge to meet the needs of that challenge problem we're interested in. A challenge is good when you have a well-defined problem, you know, a well-defined goal. A challenge is where somebody says, here is the objective. You, you know what, what success looks like. Just to, just to put it in context, that was uh, Tony Tether, who was director of DARPA at the time, and uh, highlighting you know, the, the, the value of using these types of challenges. That it, it's not a, it doesn't work for all problems that are out there, uh, but there are certain cases, uh, much like trying to develop robotic technologies for uh, disaster response or uh, underground missions. Um, I, I think that it, it definitely has shown to be highly valuable here. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight also uh, kind of uh, almost the taxonomy of how one might use challenges. And so I think uh, a competition where you're able to take advantage of the energy of different performers, different competitors uh, to push, push. I, I think that's uh, really compelling just from a baseline. And you're able to do that through however you structure the definition of the problem. I think a prize incentive certainly just gives you another tool or another incentive here um, to, to drive. And there are a couple of them and DARPA is proud to be able to leverage that type of a prize authority as well. I think what sets apart prize challenges or prize competitions from a DARPA challenge, however, is to say that in addition to there being prizes, in addition it, into it being a competition, that there is a significant emphasis on being able to not only advance the technology to that next plateau, that next level, but also to be able to take advantage of the opportunity to engage with the public and assess broader impact. And I think this is a way in which one might seed a, or, or help foster a nascent community or research field and really help set the foundation for uh, breakthroughs, not necessarily uh, in six months, but uh, being able to make the, uh, make that opportunity available. And I think that's a major part of it. Now, I'm pleased to be a roboticist living in the tactical technology office at DARPA, where we deal with systems and platforms and all of the integration, uh, I'll call them joys of getting real robots to work. Um, and so a DARPA TTO challenge takes a DARPA challenge even one step farther and says, how can we realize that vision in a physical manifestation in, in some way. So uh, really here's how I tend to think about challenges uh, and, and I'm certainly pleased and honored to be able to do that here at DARPA. And so just speaking a little bit about community and, and the role that I hope and believe that the Sub-T Challenge will continue to press forward on is in fostering community. So of course, having everything from a forum in which we can share ideas and, and have discussions to being able to capture a lot of this and being able to share that with the broader audience through our uh, Sub-T Challenge uh, videos and showcases and things like that, as well as our uh, public facing sites to really disseminate a lot of the information and knowledge that we're, we're gathering to a, uh, uh, to, to non-experts, really. I, I think this is where you can capture the imagination and, and uh, accelerate and calibrate that ex excitement from, uh, from the public. One of the other elements here that I'm personally in incredibly um, proud, but also uh, committed to is how do we accelerate? What are the ways in which we can use the opportunities that the Sub-T Challenge affords us 
to press forward for the broader research community in robotics. And so not everyone has easy access to a coal mine or to an unfinished nuclear power plant or to a myriad other types of venues. And so what DARPA has done is collected ground truth data, professional survey grade, uh, point cloud data, as well as reference data sets, uh, videos, um, immersive scans, as well as a robotics reference set as well, uh, reference data set as well, using a, a, a ground robot to go and collect these um, uh, data sets as well. And all of that's publicly available. So if you're a, a roboticist, whether you're just starting out or you're really getting into the field of field robotics, uh, here are a number of data sets that one can potentially use. You can couple this with the Sub-T simulator uh, to help uh, build this out. And this is again, based on open robotics Ignition Gazebo, that next-gen simulation for robotic simulations, we're able to do these massive scales of both robots and robot teams. You can imagine bringing in your brand new robot models and porting them and putting them into the sub tech repo. Not only you, but competitors from all around the world can potentially make use of those robots or your novel sensor payloads, including comms relays and what have you. Or you could just go and build new worlds and see how your robotic systems can do uh, and and provide and it provides a, a way to help accelerate and and benefit the broader community. And to that end, of course, even making use of our Hello SubT World tutorial sets will get you to the point where anyone out there right now following that GitHub tutorial can go ahead and qualify for the virtual competition just by going through these tutorials. So it's an opportunity, I hope, for folks to recognize not only what a SubT challenge can do for the community from afar but potentially even impact uh, your experiences as a roboticist, either getting into or advancing your own field robotics work. So in case anyone's interested, I again encourage you, we do have the final events coming up next fall. Uh, it's not too late to join in, whether for the systems competition or the virtual competition. So come take a look if you're interested. Qualifications will be later in the springtime. And ahead of that, you'll get all the information that you need just by registering here for the latest updates. Um, if you're interested, I encourage you to just check out our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, I think you'll find a lot of good videos there just to kind of see where, where things are. Um, and as always, I encourage and welcome anyone to reach out to Subfeed Challenge at DARPA.mil and uh, engage with me and my team. And so with that, uh, again, really appreciate the opportunity and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tim. Uh, this was an excellent talk. Um, um, before we are, we are starting to get a few questions in, but uh, let me have a question of my own. So this is regarding setting challenges. Um, so the sometimes um, we are thrust into a scenario where we have to deal with a certain situation, COVID, for example, uh, but sometimes we get to pick our challenges to advance our technologies. So as, as uh, I think uh, it was mentioned in the talk that some of the problems are really complex and it has to be defined properly to set a challenge, to make it very clear and have a very set benchmark on, on how to move forward. So how do you, um, do, could you give your insight into how DARPA or, or you personally set challenges to determine what the boundaries are? Where should you um, have more difficulty and what areas you would ease off because you know that there's that more difficult or maybe they have been solved? Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, I, I, I think the essence of your question there is how can you bundle a complex problem in a way that is nice and succinct so that you can rally a community around solving that problem in a uniform way? And I think um, you know th that is you know the, the art of designing, I think, a vibrant and meaningful challenge. Um, so to, to give you an example, uh, the way we, you know, you're, you're trying to go and do this underground scavenger hunt for the sub-T challenge, you get a point for every artifact that you find, and you have to do it within five meters. Well, a lot of that buried in that rather simplistic, uh, you know, scoring function, um, it, 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 there's a lot that went into that, uh, to be perfectly honest. So uh, understanding if you're going into a, a zone that's five kilometers traversable length, and you're now looking for 0.1% drift in your localization, for example, from SLAM, then you want to then be able to localize. And if you did your best case, you would be able to find something 
uh, assuming your sensor models are perfect, you'd be able to localize that 0.1% of a five kilometer traversal is five meters. So that kind of, we backed out those kind of technological metrics, for example, 1%, 0.1% drift, uh, you know, uh, ideally, um, and, and turn that into uh, something that makes sense to the end user. It turns out, for example, that uh, localizing a survivor to within, basically, if you're a fire, you know, first responder in a fire smoke-filled scenario, you can only see about your, you know, your your arms span, and that five meter, two and a half meter uh, radii is about all you get to work with. And so that turns out to be being able to localize, sending that firefighter to within uh, almost arm's reach is, uh, is is the key there. So I, th I think you're absolutely right that it is quite challenging, um, but when you're able to find uh, a, a meaningful way to simplify and to reduce. And I think this is what we try to do as technologists is to be able to uh, neck it down to the essence of the problem. Always try to maintain traceability with the technology metrics that you're uh, you know, interested in pursuing and then packaging it in a way that engages the public, fascinates and inspires their imagination while also driving uh, our, our technologists to, to, to put the technology and push the technology forward. Thanks, Tim. Um, so we have a question from Andrew who asks, what novel technologies generated by this challenge would, do you think would go viral in the future? Go viral. Oh, that's a, uh, if, if, if only I knew the answer to that. But um, I, I do think there are uh, quite a number of technologies, but I'd say also in addition to those technologies is the know-how. This notion of uh, field robotics, of you know being able to put your robots out there and hope they, they survive, um, I think is, is uh, going to be the, uh, the intangible that we get out of the sub-T challenge. In terms of specific technologies, I think we're already starting to see the, the spin-outs that are uh, arising, everything from integrated autonomy packs that uh, embed perception and tightly couple that to the planning and autonomy piece. I think that's going to be wide, you know, far, far, far reaching in terms of uh, where that kind of technology gets uh, leveraged. Um, I think the uh, concepts of operation of when, what robots should be used, uh, how to team those robots, how to send in, let's say, scouts, you know, aerial scouts before your ground rovers or your ground scouts before your air vehicles or your network extension robots. I mean, that I think will also come into play. And then the other place I think that really would benefit is um, the, the notion of, uh, you know, the human multi-robot team interface. So the actual gaming console, gaming interface that's going to allow you to interact with your teammates uh, in, a, in a very st streamlined way. So we're already seeing a lot of those types of nuggets of inspiration transition into more uh, hardened technologies, if you will. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of those uh, coming to a, a robotics firm near you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Rim. Uh, we have one more question from Ash. He was asking, what are the next challenges being considered in what kind of environments? Right. Well, maybe this is my opportunity to turn it back over to you and the broader community. Uh, if you have great ideas for what might make for another DARPA challenge, I invite you to come, come in and, and pitch it and uh, maybe launch a challenge of your own uh, here at DARPA. So um, I think uh, there are no shortages of really big problems to be solved. And DARPA is always eager to pursue and, and find the people who can lead the charge to, to answer some of those really big problems. Thanks, Tim. Um, um, we'll move on to the, to, to the next speaker, but we'll come back. Please keep sending us questions at the end of the session. We'll, we'll, we'll have a final chat with our panelists. Um, so the, our final speaker of the day is, um, of, of the session is Dr. Xavier Wagadis. Uh, Xavier is a systems engineering with uh, a systems engineer with a background in mechatronics. His first contact with autonomous driving was in 2002, where he worked as a driverless truck project manager in Daimler uh, in Daimler Benz in uh, research in Germany. Since starting at Bosch, he has moved around the world developing chassis control and advanced driver as assistance systems, gaining over 15 years of experience in developing development of vehicle safety technologies. 
As a Scrum manager and then project leader for autonomous driving, he has been focusing on the challenges of system integration of complex networked vehicle systems since 2014. With that, let me hand over to Mantel. Uh, let me hand over the mantle to Xavier, who is joining us from Melbourne. Thank you very much. Um, hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can. Right. All right. Well, then I'll, I'll share my screen and um, we can get started. All right. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to talk today. Um, I'll give some insight on, on the Bosch uh, um, like automated driving uh, approach like since it started um, a couple of years ago, give a bit of background to the company and how um, the history of innovation essentially brought us to automated driving. And we'll look also specifically at one, um, one area that has been uh, my main uh, focus for the last couple of years, which is a, a large trial that is being conducted um, here in, in Victoria. So a bit of background on, on the company. Um, essentially, Bosch is a company that has been around for, for a long time. Um, it uh, has 400,000 associates uh, worldwide that are distributed across many different locations. Um, there's a strong focus on, on, on research um, and, and innovation. And it's been also very much uh, directed by um, like the foundation father, the Robert Bosch at the time. And uh, something that maybe some people might not be entirely aware of, um, the, the company is actually held by a foundation. Um, so essentially the, the profits that are generated by the company go to a charitable cause um, in, in different areas of um, medical research, uh, global understanding, but also a very big push on um, a lot of um, areas in research that see are seen as positive uh, in terms of the impact on, on society in, in general. So um, with, with that in mind, um, it's, it's something that has been driving a lot of like the, the strategy of the, of the company um, over the last years. And um, traditionally, I think a lot of the, the, the wider public has a, maybe a, an awareness of, of consumer goods, um, but um, it is actually only one small part of the, the overall company with a major focus on on, on mobility solutions really um, over the, the last years. Um, and interestingly enough now, I think with um, a number of the innovations of happening over the last years, um, we see actually a lot of areas of technology that are merging and, and blending across those different um, business sectors. Um, and in many ways, automated driving is um, like a, the typical example for that. Like um, automated driving is not purely uh, limited to development of a vehicle. Um, it requires services um, to be able to operate connected services. And it also is something that has a, a bigger impact at a societal level in terms of um, how people um, are going to commute um, and how they're going to um, be able to uh, interact also with, uh, with technology in, in general. So, um, in that sense, the, like the, the push for, for corporate research um, to be like a fundamental part of the input into the, the strategy um, has been like cemented over the years. Um, Bosch has a, a large corporate research campus in, in Renningen in Southern Germany, which was um, inaugurated in um, 2015. Uh, this, this center is um, um, essentially, uh, um, like contained in, in, in one location with 2,000 associates on, on sites. We've got our research um, uh, built facilities with um, different laboratories and, and workshops, including specific uh, robotic um, laboratories as well, and a test track to um, test um, a lot of the, the vehicles that are being developed um, with uh, the different types of functions in, in that field. So, um, in, in many ways, um, like it, there's a, an approach of, of having a look at fundamental research uh, areas in, in the form of computing and communication, uh, nano quantum technologies, material science, biotechnology, robotics, AR, and so on. Um, they have been like a continuing throughout like the, 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 the corporate research or the history to uh, create like um, new ideas, new innovations, 
And then to see how that fits in with the demand that is coming from, from the markets, um, the changes in, in society, um, that is what drives um, like the, 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 the strategy of the company over time. So um, the corporate research is very much at the, at the core of, of that approach. And um, over time, I guess the yeah, four pillars, if you want, are really directed towards um, uh, robotics and automation, um, electrification, energy efficiency, uh, connectivity, and also looking at um, the emerging markets at, as a, a huge potential like uh, for uh, uh, improvements there uh, in terms of um, society. So um, in, in many ways, um, like, um, like one of the, the examples of the areas that um, is permeating all uh, parts of, uh, of industry uh, is uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and in that context, uh, Bosch founded like a dedicated center for, for that in 2017, um, with locations across uh, uh, Germany, uh, China, India, US, and uh, Israel, and about 300 employees. And similarly to the, 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 the concept of, of the corporate research uh, division, um, they support the, the other business units um, uh, by providing insights and um, and solutions uh, to product development um, that's happening in, in those different areas. So I think um, th this is something that's been incredibly um, useful because um, it's um, it gives access to um, the internal divisions to um, like very specialized uh, research um, in the in the context of automated driving, for example. Um, explainable uh, deep learning is one of the areas that particularly important for validation purposes. Um, and so that's one of the areas that has been um, like very uh, well supported by the, the Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence. So this goes across the board, like uh, in terms of like the, the different areas that, that we're, we're looking at. And I think you, you'll see that, that many of those are actually um, not relevant to one specific industry. Um, and, and get the understanding how like, the value of having like a centralized um, approach to um, the, the distribution of knowledge around machine learning and, and AI is something that is, is becoming increasingly um, uh, like of, of value in the context of uh, innovation. Now, I'll give you a couple examples of, of some of the, the, the spin-offs that, that came out of that approach. Um, like one of the, 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 the key uh, sort of historical focuses of, of Bosch has been the development of product, products in the area of road safety. Um, so the invention of, the, of ABS, ESP, airbag technology historically have been like some of the areas where, where Bosch has um, had a, a very large contribution. Um, and more recently, like we're looking at essentially the democratization of that technology. Like over time, obviously, um, the, there's the intention to, to make it available um, to maximize the, the road safety uh, benefits um, of, of those technology and um, automatic emergency braking is, is, is something that is now becoming increasingly available. Um, has been relying mainly on a combination of, of camera and radar um, over the last years and with the re research done uh, by the computer vision labs that we have in, in Hildesheim, um, we've been able to actually create a solution that is video only um, and has been um, like um, a, a really great success um, since it's been introduced uh, into the market. Uh, a different approach like uh, in the field of robotics is the actual support of um, in, the, in the context of, um, um, of production environments um, and automation by having uh, robotic assistance. Um, so the idea here is um, to be able to have um, an assistant working side by side with, uh, with human operators. Um, so again, a, an approach that was uh, pioneered by the, the corporate research environment and then rolled out and deployed to, to different um, uh, production sites um, at Bosch and, and shows like one of the opportunities of um, robotics having a direct uh, impact also like a, in a production environment. Um, the last one I'll, I'll talk about um, is like the idea of creating um, an AD kit that's modular and, and scalable. Um, the idea here is, is to um, have the possibility to equip different types of vehicles and, and shuttles um, with a, a robotic framework that allows it to be um, autonomous 
And um, as we know, um, there's, there's, there's many different platforms that, that um, are, are relevant in, in this context, whether it's uh, uh, like for, for human transport or goods. Um, and so the idea here is to look at um, a way of creating like a, a, a system that can be fitted to different types of platforms, allowing for um, like a, a dedicated um, adaptation to the environment it's going to, to operate in. Okay, so yeah, as I said, the, like there's a, a very strong sort of, it's in the, the Bosch DNA, the, the, the history of, of, of uh, development of um, products in the, in the area of, of road safety. So both active safety systems, ESP, ABS, um, automatic emergency braking, um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, and over time, increasingly also um, advanced driver assistance uh, system um, that um, overall, have created sort of this, um, the, the different building blocks um, for, for automated driving. And I guess what, what's really important is to always kind of see the different dimensions to this in terms of saying, um, yes, there's the technological challenge. You have to find a solution that's going to work um, to address a certain problem, but really um, like an, an equal focus on, on the safety um, aspects in, in actually rolling out and deploying this, this technology to um, like um, a very large um, population. So um, the, the aspects related to um, like the, the validation of, of, these, um, of these different functions and, and systems is something that's absolutely instrumental um, and is one of the areas that um, kind of differentiates um, like the, the challenge a little bit, the validation requirements uh, for a safety critical system are obviously um, significantly higher than if it's a consumer good um, uh, environment. So yeah, over time, um, a very large number of different components being developed. Uh, Bosch as a supplier um, has developed like these components like independently essentially to, to serve different needs in, in the market. Um, what's really interesting about automated driving is you need to combine like, um, like all those hardware components um, with then some level of orchestration, um, if you want. Like, so there's a dimension of understanding system, architect system architecture and how to integrate both um, the hardware and software um, to be able to have communication between all of those uh, different components. Um, and this is something that um, is a very significant challenge. Um, the, the environment um, that um, we have in, in, in automotive obviously has a lot of, of defined standards in terms of um, the safety uh, critical components of a vehicle. And um, the moment you hand over control to, to a system uh, that can actuate like uh, the, the brakes um, specifically and the steering, obviously the, the safety uh, constraints uh, increase even, even further. So. Um, there's a lot of um, considerations around defining not just um, uh, like a, an architecture that allows uh, communication within this complex uh, vehicle network, but also um, to have fail operational um, strategy and the possibility to um, like rely on redundant systems in the case um, one of the components um, has a, an issue. So um, th there needs to be um, like a, um, an overarching view across the, the whole system. And to do so, uh, certain domain controllers which have the capability of managing uh, certain functions. Um, and this is one of the, the key areas that uh, is, is particularly interesting uh, in automated driving because uh, there didn't used to be that sort of um, next level layer to, to that system coordination in, in the past uh, that was not necessarily required. Um, and has been like one of the, the areas that have been particularly interesting uh, when it came to, to defining like, uh, how the different um, systems need to interact with each other. So one thing to understand though, Bosch doesn't manufacture cars. Um, so whilst we like uh, manufacture many different components, like we, we do not manufacture the vehicles themselves. Um, so in terms of development, um, we've been relying on donor vehicles uh, I'll, I'll give a bit of a, a background to uh, like the, the activities here and also starting to look now and what's happening here specifically in, in Australia. So um, 
Now, just following up from uh, Timothy's talk, um, the DAPA Open Challenge was very much like a, a, a founding uh, moment for uh, automated driving in general across the, the world. Uh, absolutely fascinating competition and that produced uh, like a legacy of, of knowledge, um, but also uh, vocations, I guess, to, to work in this field, uh, including myself. Um, and so at the start of the, the Bosch, um, the Bosch automated driving adventure was actually a selection of participants from the DAPA Urban Challenge that um, came together and were recruited at the time to form the, a team that was split between Palo Alto and, and Germany. Um, and from there onwards, essentially, the, the idea was to, to create like um, a platform that would allow to explore the different challenges of automated driving using um, both the existing technology, but also um, having the possibility to adapt that across um, like uh, different uh, use cases, different functions, um, different scopes, uh, different operational design domains. So um, it's important to maybe also understand that um, in terms of like the, the approach we have to, to research and development, um, you can kind of separate like the the approach of, of having um, like a, a laboratory on wheels that allows you for rapid prototyping of, um, of robotic um, algorithms for localization, decision-making, perception, and, and so on, um, which is quite different to the approach that you'd have when you want to go like right into the, the series production where you're, you're going towards embedded um, um, an embedded environment. And um, then you have a dedicated sort of um, uh, architecture that have dedicated components that have already reached a certain level of maturity. So today I'll talk a bit more about like the first part. It's, if you want like a, a rolling laboratory on wheels, it allows us to, to have a, a, a modular approach um, to be able to continuously upgrade components um, in terms of, of sensor hardware, computation, um, and, and so on. And um, interestingly enough, we also like use ROS um, it's still very much um, the right platform to, to do this type of rapid prototyping activity. Um, and I guess, yeah, over time, like we've definitely had like different shifts in, in focus. Uh, we started with, um, with the first uh, prototype um, that was based on a, on a BMW 3 Series at the time. Um, and we then expanded our fleet to a, a range of different vehicles. Um, important to understand that essentially all functions are then deactivated and replaced by, by our systems. Um, and then over time, we look at, at different focus areas, which could be um, like very high integration. So um, for example, the current vehicle, we, we use um, uh, six different radar sensors, uh, six uh, laser scanners. We've got a um, uh, serial video camera and, uh, and so on, but we are, in the position to be to sort of uh, reconfigure that sensor set, uh, depending on like the the development the developments in, in those fields, which allows us then to um, to increase the capabilities of the of the system, and also then tailor it to different types of, of environments. Um, so we've been on the road on public roads since 2012 um, in the US and in, in Germany. In Australia, um, the ITS World Congress was when we presented like the, the local vehicle that was built up here in, in Australia um, based on the prototypes that were developed in, in the US and, and Germany. Um, this vehicle has been going through ranges of um, um, upgrades essentially to, to get it to where it is today. Um, today, it's, um, it's defined more as a highway pilot function that's sort of focusing specifically on um, what could be a, well, that's maybe one interesting topic, the level three to level four um, uh, type of uh, automation level. And um, we have been conducting a, a trial specifically on, on rural roads uh, since um, the end of, of 2018. Um, and I'll get to that to sort of describe some of the, the, the background on why we've been doing this um, and some of the, the outcomes that, that we've had. So, from, from that, those, those early days now, we've got like a, a range of different functions that, um, that have become available, um, products and, and services as we discussed that are related to automated driving that, that um, start popping up. Um, and like they have different levels of, of uh, automation. 
I think um, the the SA levels are, are very um, uh, like restrictive in the way they define things um, because they don't actually um, necessarily sort of represent like the function um, scope. So let's say talking about the the, the highway pilot, um, the idea is, is being able to hand over control to the system for for a certain period of time and then take back control. But if you're going to design a system like that, um, you need to consider what will happen if the driver does not take back control. So um, there could be different reasons for that. Um, he could be asleep. Um, he could have a medical emergency. Um, the system still needs to be capable of, of handling those type of situation. And so technically, if it needs to be able to, to do that, well, that's the definition more towards a level four function because it needs to then take control and um, make sure that the vehicle gets to a, a safe location um, independently. So those different types of, um, of products that we've got here are, are like all being investigated by Bosch. Some of them have actually come now into, into the market. Um, and today, like, um, yeah, I'll focus a bit more on, on the highway pilot function because this is the, was the main scope of the, the trial that was conducted here um, in Victoria over the last um, two years. It starts with something a bit of a philosophical, um, if you want, like the the question, what is a highway? Um, and it's it's not as as uh, easy as it sounds. Um, I think maybe a lot of us will think of an environment maybe similar to a German autobahn when we think about a highway, very defined, um, very um, like a specific type of, of environment in terms of the the infrastructure, the the access to that. Um, to that highway, the type of traffic that you could expect um, and, and so on. But the truth is that highways come in, in many different shapes and forms. So um, like that's an urban highway in Osaka in, in, in Japan um, and in India, like you'll have um, again, a different type of, of highway, different type of, of road users, um, different types of densities and also um, uh, behaviors. So that, that is something that is, um, is, is, is quite challenging because uh, if we wanted to find a function, like we have to have a, uh, like ask ourselves the questions on which one of these highways do, want, do we want it to be allowed to be activated? Where um, will it be able of, of handling all the scenarios that it will encounter um, in, in this particular environment? So um, for that, I think um, as, a, as a nod maybe to like the, the first presentation um, and Terry, I hope like you, uh, you'll find my uh, my description of the distance to the moon as acceptable. Um, I, I'd like to give you a bit uh, a sense of of dimensions here. Like um, so, the moon is far away, um, but like in terms of of like the the numbers of kilometers that that we drive here, like on on Earth every year, um, it's it's quite remarkable. Uh, just just in the U.S. over one year, we're talking about three point twenty two trillion miles. So. Um, imagine that in terms of scale, like um, over the globe, and and think of all the the single journeys that that take place, um, different uh, between different locations under different uh, um, environmental conditions, weather conditions, um, different times of the day. Um, this is this is what's sometimes been described in automated driving as as scenario hell. Uh, there's there's an infinite complexity to to reality, um, and we need to kind of select like a certain portion of that um, first to um, have a, a definition of the operational design domain that is going to ensure that wherever we decide to deploy a function like this, um, it's actually going to be able to, to handle those um, different scenarios. So it's, it's really the emphasis on saying um, development of, of, of self-driving technology is like the, the, the actual getting the car to drive itself that's not the hard part. The hard part is to get it to drive safely within those operational design domain um, definition. So th that's the part that's really um, keeping us busy and why um, like you don't see automated driving vehicles everywhere on the road just yet. Um, there's definitely going to be an iterative approach to this. Um, and um, if we want the technology to be successful, like we need to be confident in its cap capabilities. So it does mean also that on top of, of, um, of that, like conditions are different from country to country. 
Um, and um, so this is one of the, the main reasons why, why Bosch uh, is conducting automated driving um, research, not just in, in one single location, but um, across um, different um, uh, regions. So mainly in, in Germany, uh, the US, um, in China, in Japan, um, and also in Australia at the moment. But um, it goes beyond that as um, there are further trials that are being uh, also conducted in, in other countries. So let, let's look now at our project here in, in Australia. Um, there's a specific um, uh, like use case here in, in Australia that um, is, is worth sort of investigating is we, we have a, a huge road network um, and a very low population density. So um, as a consequence of that, we get these huge um, um, like distances between different uh, hubs, different uh, cities, which with very low infrastructure. Um, and it's it's interesting because on the one hand side, it's the ideal environment for the um, the automated driving function, such as a highway pilot, because um, these type of mono monotonous roads, um, like they, they're ideally suited for, for automation in many ways. Um, and they're also, from a road safety perspective, like um, this is where half of the fatalities occur uh, on these type of roads because of the monotony, because uh, people falling asleep, uh, being distracted. There's a lot of, of runoffs, a lot of accidents happening specifically in this type of environment. Um, and now, so in collaboration with the Transport Accident Commission and, and the, the Victoria uh, Department of Transport, uh, we've been conducting a, a project over the last year to investigate the impact of the Victorian environment specifically um, on the availability of, uh, of such a, a function. So um, the, the key areas of, of focus here is uh, looking at um, like the, the road design, if you want, um, understanding like the like the, the type of um, situations that we'll encounter on, on, on these roads in terms of infrastructure, um, but also looking at uh, some of the technological challenges because um, we're going into remote environments where uh, potentially, first of all, like there's, there's not a lot of like a visual differentiation um, in, in that environment. Um, there's not necessarily good coverage in terms of, of mobile networks. Um, and I think, that is something that, that, is, that is quite unique to, to that area. So looking at localization um, is one of the, the main um, areas of, of focus. And um, like the, the different environmental conditions are, are challenging in itself, but there's an added sort of layer to that when you're in an environment where um, if you take two pictures and they may be 100 kilometers apart, like you won't necessarily be able to actually say where they were taken along that stretch because the environment looks so, so similar. So in our case, um, like, like Bosch has been working on, on the development of um, like a, a multimodal approach for, for uh, localization of automated driving vehicles, um, not solely relying on um, GNSS or, or video, but adding like an additional layer of information um, that um, is recorded uh, in prior mapping when generating high definition maps um, with radar technology. So specifically um, in, in this particular uh, situation, we look at, at combining um, like all those different um, uh, sensor technologies to create like a, a fingerprint of the environment that's going to be unique enough that even if at a human level, we can't see uh, the differences, um, well, the system will be capable of, of doing that. And so, um, across that that, um, that whole trial, like we've been increasingly sort of um, uh, like reducing the, the reliance on uh, on GNSS down to zero, um, so that we could localize ourselves in this type of um, highway uh, use case, like entirely without any uh, GPS input, for example. So um, that was one of the key areas of, of research. So yeah, to to um, to highlight sort of the importance of that, um, the, the, the traditional robotic approach of, of having multiple inputs um, to increase um, like your, your confidence uh, in uh, it, which is again present across like all the areas of whether it's localization, perception or, or decision-making. Um, it's, it's definitely better to have multiple inputs confirming um, like uh, what you are seeing 
Um, and this is the, the case in, in, in the area of localization as well, where we've got essentially like three different inputs um, into, um, into the system, which um, one dimension is the, the feature-based localization that I was um, mentioning, which is uh, confirmed essentially by scan matching of the environment uh, by, by the onboard sensors. We've got the satellite uh, based inputs that um, could be potentially augmented with um, um, like uh, RTK type services for differential GPS. But as we know, this is something that is not always reliable, uh, can vary a lot uh, depending on where you are. Um, so not something that is necessarily sufficient uh, in all types of environment as well. When you're sort of in a, um, uh, going through a tunnel, you're, you've got like a lot of vegetation. You, you see actually the, the quality of the, of the localization provided by the GPS um, degrading. And obviously then odometry using um, inertial measurement uh, unit on board um, that helps us having a, a history essentially of where we've been and as such um, uh, like bridging also potential areas where like um, the, the GPS that's not providing much information. So let's look at the, the Australian um, highway network. Um, we've got so-called M-class roads in, in Australia. Um, now, what's interesting is a difference to the, the German highway is that um, we don't have like a, a direct uh, correlation between uh, infrastructure and classification. And that's a fundamental aspect because it means that um, the highways are defined as uh, important connections between two hubs. Like, um, so it could be two cities it doesn't necessarily going to dictate a certain type of infrastructure. So like in this image, like what, what you see here is there is actually, um, you, you'll find roundabouts um, on, on the highway. You'll find um, uh, traffic lights. Uh, you'll find um, a lot of, of cross traffic. So um, as, as you, you drive along there, well, you'll have uh, people crossing a cr like, the, like the highway, um, which is not unique to, to Australia, but definitely uh, quite common. And you actually get to um, locations where the, the highway is crossing um, like a, a small um, small city, for example, and you, you get a mix of urban and highway type environments. So that, that poses obviously a lot of, of challenges because um, like if you don't have a, a strict segregation between the use cases, well, there's going to be overlap in the requirements that you have like for an, an urban um, type um, automated function to like a, a specifically highway uh, geared um, function. So um, these are the type of, of considerations that that, um, that are important when we define the operational design domain um, uh, that need to be looked at. So it's unlikely that a early highway pilot functions will be capable of handling as well these type of intersection completely autonomously. Um, another aspect is um, uh, here in Australia, because they're, they're, we don't have the same sort of um, amount of um, network um, throughout like um, all the, um, the different um, um, cities and, and main hubs that they may have in, in, in Europe, for example, or more densely populated uh, locations, like you will see the highway being used as a bike lane uh, as well. Uh, so that's something that's authorized in, in Australia. Um, we have um, bicycles using the emergency lane as a, as a bike lane um, to, to commute as well. Um, and again, an interesting use case that's, that's um, uh, of, of a um, situation that is not common like in, in, in Germany where cyclists are clearly not allowed on, on, on the highway um, and driving like significant perception requirements to identify them uh, with, uh, with very high um, differential speeds in that particular case. Another uh, aspect is tractors. So you see a lot of tractors potentially um, in uh, regional uh, Victoria where like they, 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 the roads actually have a direct access um, um, like to the, the paddocks um, and uh, that are right next to the, the highway. So these vehicles are on the road. They've got um, a very low speed. And so both from a, from a planning and decision-making perception point of view, um, they need to be considered. But also um, this direct access to the highway um, means that uh, there's additional challenges. So you see gravel roads coming straight up to the highway. Um, and we've been testing through winter. We've had a lot of situations where um, tractors or, or even 
uh, large trucks coming from quarries would, would actually carry a lot of mud across to the, the highway, um, bringing challenges from a motion control perspective. So you hit these patches of, um, of slippery mud. Um, well, none of this is particularly pleasant for a human driver, but like uh, in terms of automation, it does drive like even uh, higher requirements if there is not a direct correlation between um, road friction and um, the, um, the, the grip level of the road surface. Um, so there's a number of, of different aspects that, that we're identifying and, and it's really important to, to highlight how much um, of this exchange is, in, is, uh, is critical to, to being able to deploy those, those systems into the market in the future. Like if, if for us um, who, who are sort of really inside the, the, the research environment, like we, we know we're dealing with very complex technology that um, um, needs to span across many different disciplines. Um, it's very challenging for anyone in this field to, to be across like uh, all those topics. Um, imagine how challenging that is for um, obviously the, the governments who need to, to regulate um, like these type of, of, um, of systems and the introduction into the market. Um, so there's, there's a very fundamental aspect in the exchange between the government bodies and in industry um, from one end to be able to understand like the technology um, by the government agencies and, and, and prepare like the, the, the frameworks that will be required. Um, and for industry also to have access to um, like the, the, the management of, of assets, the management of infrastructure that is happening in, in, um, in, in road management understanding road safety, um, specifically the, uh, the, the, the identified sort of areas that are particularly critical. And um, as such, like through that exchange, like being able to have a, a, a grad, gradual sort of uh, a roadmap being laid out to understanding um, like both, like what is required from an infrastructure perspective, um, uh, from a societal acceptance, um, as well as from an industry perspective to understanding like the use cases that need to be um, identified um, in the course of um, uh, like the introduction. Um, uh, at the end here, um, Roadworks is usually one of my, my favorites to um, show a number of like the, the, the challenges that you actually directly deal, deal with uh, when, when you're out there. Um, this, this is again, something that's interesting for humans as well, but um, try to, to see it like through the eyes of, of, um, of a robot and then how you want to, to handle that uh, in a particular um, situation. Those examples, like everything I've been showing are actually like straight out of the, the, the raw images that have been captured by the vehicle while we were out there. Um, and driving through, through like these type of locations, you'll understand why roadworks are likely to be sort of one of the areas that are going to come very late in terms of the operational design domain of these systems. So this one's interesting. Um, there's clearly a sign there. Um, what the speed is, is a bit more difficult to, to actually guess. Um, so definitely uh, got an issue with, with, with maintenance here in terms of the grass uh, getting a little bit too high. Um, another one that is, is one of my favorites. Um, so you have to pick here. Um, obviously there's um, like slightly conflicting information. Um, again, like human drivers, they, they can make a decision um, based on experience, but like, yeah, how do we want to handle this from a decision-making aspect um, from for an automated um, driving vehicle? Um, this one is, is very similar, but there's um, also conflicting sources of information here, like service vehicles uh, pointing to different directions, um, not necessarily something that you want to react to. So um, um, this is something that where like uh, you can see some of the, the challenges of, um, of of machine vision specifically. Uh, in that case, like interpretation of that um, is one aspect, but then what the decisions you're going to make um, is, is yet another challenge. As a final example, um, this is a picture I took uh, in, in Germany. Um, we've taken a lot more of those pictures since then also here in, in Australia. Um, there are sort of unexpected sort of situations where, well, if you've got a a machine vision based system, obviously it's interpreting its environment. It's looking at, at different types of, uh, of uh, features um, that it can recognize, such as lane markings and um, other vehicles. Um, and this one is, um, there's obviously solutions to, to dealing with that. There's, there's no questions. Um, the question is, is never about like uh, finding a solution to one of the, the use cases you found. It's more about the ones you haven't found. 
Um, and so that, that is something that's going to drive like a lot of the, the, the continuous sort of efforts in, in the area of, of validation and, and verification of, of these type of systems. So in that regard, I'll, I'll point out like as a last, um, a last area of, of, um, of, uh, of research that's, that's also being uh, looked at, um, it's the topic of validation of, of uh, specifically um, a, like machine vision based systems. Um, and so safety critical systems in, in that field. Uh, there's a very large publicly funded project happening uh, in Germany, uh, funded to the like the level of $20 million. So um, that is something that is um, very much in, in focus and Bosch is contributing to that. And um, I'll highlight um, this specific paper that was published um, earlier this year uh, regarding the use of deep learning specifically in safety critical perception tasks, um, because this one is, it's, it's one of the, the areas that um, like to deliver many solutions, but also comes with, with a lot of additional uh, constraints, um, like the dependency on, on the data that is provided to actually train um, the algorithms and, and, and the challenge of, of the, the correlations that are learned that may not be causal, that they just learned because of the data that, that has been uh, made available. Um, and, and the general sort of problem of having like data distribution not necessarily accurately representing um, like the, the real world. So um, on that, um, I'd like to thank you uh, very much all for uh, your attention. And um, if there's any questions, happy to take them. Uh, thanks, thanks, Xavier. Um, we are running a bit of sh uh, short on time, so we'll go straight to uh, a question for all the panelists. Um, we, are, we are very grateful to have such great speakers um, joining us in spite of their time, time commitments and um, especially thankful for Terry staying us for long. Um, thankful for Tim. Uh, he has been organizing the DARPA participants challenge and he was able to take time off that at the end of the day to join us even at a late hour. Um, so one question that I would like to pose um, to Terry, Tim and, and Xavier, uh, first Terry, um, is for, do you have any, um, any um, uh, messages, advice uh, for our young researchers, students, scientists to, to actually work on big problems and make a big impact for robotics? What would be your advice for, for our young uh, researchers, upcoming researchers? Wow, that's such a huge open-ended question. I'm, I'm not really sure where to start. Um, other than saying, I think, um, you know, this is probably the best time to be involved with robotics. I mean, it is just it's, it's amazing if you compare where the field is today versus even five, 10 years ago. I mean, there's so many opportunities where you can have a big impact. It, it's not just that you have to go, you know, solve a problem for, for, for NASA or, or DARPA or, uh, you know, anywhere else. I mean, you can have a giant impact, uh, you know, working terrestrially, whether that's in agriculture or in self-driving cars or whatever. Um, and so one thing is, you know, you know, don't be afraid to just really reach out and, and get involved with whatever seems to be the most exciting, interesting, best place. I mean, you should just, you should just ask. I mean, my two, two favorite words are just ask. Um, I think if you want to get involved in space things, um, one thing that's really exciting right now is, that, of course, in Australia, the Australian Space Agency is, is, is really starting up and it's, it's launching new things. I, I understand there's a, a trailblazer program coming in the next couple of months. Um, I, I, will, I will say that, that NASA and the, uh, the ASA have been talking extensively the past few months, and so there is a partnership in the works. Uh, so if you're interested in space, um, you don't have to go very far. Um, ASA is going to be there and uh, in partnership with NASA. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Terry. Over to Tim. Same question. Yeah, thanks. Um, you, you know, Terry's two-word answer uh, was, was great, so I've got my own two-word answer, which is go big. Uh, so if you're a graduate student or you're a researcher, I, I encourage you to um, really think, you know, those big thoughts, leave it to your advisor, leave it to your sponsor to try to rein you back in. And I think being ambitious in the, the, the magnitude of what you um, think your impact could be uh, in the myriad places, whether it's uh, in the science realm, whether it's in the security and safety realm, or in the commercial sector, I think there's many, many opportunities. And so uh, I think from from the perspective that, uh, as, as Terry mentioned as well, there are just uh, so many opportunities out there um, that I do encourage any uh, you know early career or junior folks to 
uh, really reach out. And same goes, you know, to, to for for DARPA, we're always on the lookout for uh, transformative ideas that can grow into, you know, quite uh, substantive impact, whether it's through the sub challenge or through the other efforts that DARPA has. So never hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me or, or to, to DARPA or any of these types of organizations that are uh, known for driving innovation. So uh, certainly welcome the engagement. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Xavier, same question. Yeah, I think the two other panels did a great job at summarizing it's never been a better time um, and the possibilities are endless. Um, I think that's, that's one of the key aspects um, today, like that's at the technology level, there's, there's um, a lot of opportunities that can be applied in many different industries. So um, be ambitious in terms of like the, the, the research that you do and you will find applications for it. I think that's the, the, main, uh, the main message um, is uh, that there's definitely an appetite right now for, for um, like what robotics um, can contribute in, in many different areas. Um, and we're kind of entering a golden age um, in, in many ways. Uh, a big thank you for, for all the participants who came in and um, thank you for all the speakers.